Hey. Let's go. What did you do? Did you do something? Did you do something to make it go live on here? I just clicked in phrase. All right, so then it goes live as soon as you do it there. Right? It does, because I saw when it started showing us at one second, two seconds, it was when you first clicked that. Yeah, so when you click that, it goes live. Guys, okay, we're going to get started. Everyone? Tom. Tom? We're going to put you in a corner. We're going to put you in a corner with a dunce cap on. <laughs> All right, good, good. All right, Guys, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't express to you how happy I am to be back and fully charged. And uh, we're, we have so many great uh, things ahead of us. I'm, I'm really uh, motivated to teach you guys a couple of things that I picked up while I was away. As you guys know, when I do go away, I take time to read a lot and I take time to learn more things so I can hopefully pass on that information to you guys and maybe spark uh, a change in your life. So while I was away, I did pick up a couple good books. I, I, picked, I picked up uh, three, four books, actually. I finished up the uh, Gary Vee book I was reading. I read Tom's book that he gave me, uh, Make Your Bet, from that uh, uh, admiral that, um, uh, that uh, he's famous on YouTube. He's got like six million views. I don't know if you guys have ever seen. He gave a presentation at a, at a, at a college, I um, forget which one it was. I think it was like North Carolina, somewhere. somewhere. Yeah, somewhere down south. Uh, but he talked about like starting your day off by making your, your bed. And the reason why is because even if you have a, a horrible day and a rough day, you still get to come home to a made bed. So, it, but it, what it does is it also triggers uh, an events for you because if you get into a habit of doing things, especially making your bed in the morning, it makes you more disciplined to do the other things you should be doing throughout the day. So it's just kind of like a metaphor for life. But the, the book is great. You can read it in like three hours. It's short. I think that's an old school metaphor too. I think that's been It most likely is. There's other metaphors there's, like there's swallow the frog, you know, things like there's that. Yeah. yeah. What's up? Video? There's a video of this Navy, I don't know what he was, Admiral. That's him. That's a guy. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a guy. Yeah, that's a guy. Yeah. <laughs> So that that was that was one of the books that I read. That was um, uh, Make Your Bed. If you guys ever have the opportunity to pick it up or, or, or even listen to it on YouTube? There's a lot of great parts of his speech. Uh, the other one we picked, I picked up was uh, Unshakable with Tony Robbins. You guys have read that? I don't know. That's like the watered down version of the Master of uh, what is it, Ed? You read the you you read the 600 page one. What is that Master of uh, Ella? You know what it's called, right? Yeah. Business Mastery. Master of Business or Business something. Tony yeah, Tony Robbins. But it's like six or something yeah. hundred pages. It's really thick. But uh, Unshakable is like the watered down version, which kind of like basically um, pieces everything together. It's about 200 and something pages. Money but Master Game. Money Master Game. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's an excellent book either way because uh, it really does get to the point a lot quicker. Uh, the other one that uh, he wrote just gives a lot more um, interviews of uh, people who have really made it. And you know, I guess uh, more in depth into what you know what they went through, but other uh, other than that, it was a really good book. And um, the last chapter of it, which was um, more about like financial education, was really impactful, and it, it, it kind of re-educated me on a lot of things that I already knew, but I had put on the back burner for a long time. And it exemplified why it's so important to actually um, get on top of those things. So I'll be sharing those things with you and. And then currently right now I'm reading Good to Great, which is um, another great book. And that's more, and that's actually an older book that was, um, I think, put out in the early 90s. But these people spent thousands of hours researching uh, 11 companies that actually went from being mediocre, just regular, nobody would think of them, nobody wrote any articles about them, just regular companies. And then they had a change in mindset, change in management, change in the way they did their business. And they went from being average companies, maybe below average companies, to being top producers where they return higher investments than Coca-Cola, than Merck, than any of these huge companies that you think about during the, uh, during the 80s and 90s. And they did so for over 15 years straight. So it wasn't like a fluke where they just had a great year because they had like a breakout idea or a breakout you know, uh, product. It was sustained and it was because it was a change in mindset. So that's a great book too that I encourage you guys to maybe pick up one day. Um, any books that you guys have read that you think uh, would be good, a financial book um, or anything uh, of the sort? Um, there's another one that I, that, um, that's actually like a, a book that a lot of uh, high school and college students read, uh, The Richest Man in Babylon. I'm not sure if you guys have ever read that one. The principles in that, and I mean, I read that like probably over f maybe <coughs> seven years ago, but 
what I always re uh, revert back to in that book is that um, in The Richest Man in Babylon, one of the principles is that you should never get into a business that you don't understand because that's a, that's a certain way to lose your money. You know, so I, I meet a lot of real estate agents who say, I just got this opportunity to go do, I don't know, start up a, I don't know, a travel agency. Who knows? Whatever. Crazy stuff. Like things that you don't even have anything to do with what you're doing. You know, and I think to myself, I've been there. I've taken my focus off of my principal business. And all that does is derail you from getting better at what you're working at. So if things are kind of tough and they're, they're not working out as fast as you're you expecting them to, to work out, the solution is not getting yourself into three different things because all that does is just makes you kind of mediocre at, at all of these things. I'll give you a really quick, quick example. Uh, my second year in real estate, I had a breakout year and I was top producer from, from then on forward. And if someone approached me to do mortgages, uh, I was already had my mortgage license, but I would only do a mortgage here and there for a client that wanted me to do it. I wasn't like full time or anything like that. And uh, I said, you know what, that sounds like a good idea. But they, they gave me the opportunity to become the sales manager, which I don't regret because I learned a lot of leadership skills from there. But they gave me the opportunity to do that. And all that did was make me top producer in real estate to be an average producer in real estate and an average producer in, in, in mortgages. So all I, did was, um, all I did was break my time up into two places and I wasn't really that good at either one. So um, I then focused on what I really had a passion for and then I got into real estate completely and I told myself I will not let anything else derail me. I had a friend approach me about insurance and he was, he's a real good salesperson and he had a lot of good points and I figured, hey, if I get into insurance, I could do insurance for somebody who I sell a house to. I briefly got into insurance, figured out it was um, not, how would I say, like something you could just do here and there. It really is another career within itself. So I quickly reverted back to real estate because I knew that that's where my money was coming from. And I, le and I left it to the you know, people who do it uh, full time. So what I'm, what I'm explaining to you guys is that there's going to be a lot of opportunities, a lot of times where something sounds great. And if it doesn't, and if it's not part of your initial plan, if it's not going right in the direction of what you guys uh, have your goals set for, then all it's going to do is going to slow you up for where you need to be. And it's going to make you kind of juggle too many things and you're not going to be able to really do anything great. So that's what the principles are even in this book on good to great, is that these companies that did a lot of different things, they, did, they had this one thing that made them a lot of money. And then he had these other laggers. They really didn't make that much money, but it was already institutionalized and they just kept, kept with it because it was just like the status quo and they just had to keep doing it. But once they realized that, hey, look, these things make us money, these things not so much, this costs too much money and this is losing, and we're losing money with this, they got rid of everything that didn't make them a profit and they just focused on what they did great, what they could be the best in the world at. And they, that's when they performed, outperformed everyone, you know. And then I'm talking about little companies too. Like that's when really no one knew who Walgreens was, no one knew who Circuit City was back then. And then these companies just went to be, you know, the um, companies. Yeah, I mean, Trader Joe's is a good example. Yeah, Trader Joe's is another great example, a more recent example. You know, these companies that you really have never really heard of, and all of a sudden they sprout up and they're everywhere. Like you know, that's that's great. I mean, like that's something that you got to understand that um, same principle applies to you. It's not just these companies who are or huge, it's just a larger example, but you can do the same thing. So whether it's real estate, whether it's investing, whether it is whatever you do, um, you know, figure it out how to, you know, be the best at what it is that your niche is. Because within real estate, I tell you guys this all the time, there's so many niches, you know, you could be a luxury agent, you can be an investment agent, you can be a short sell expert, you can be a buyer's agent, you can do whatever it is that you want to focus on. If you really focus and honed in on that, that business will start finding its way to you. And before you know it, you'll be the best at it. You just gotta give it time, like anything else. It's not gonna be like, okay, I made my mind up. Where's all the money? No, you gotta get better at it. You gotta know the ins and outs. You gotta be real educated at it. And before you know it, you'll, you'll be there as well. Um, does anyone have an example of a book they've read that's a great financial book that maybe uh, some of us should, should pick up or maybe even a lecture you guys heard somewhere? I know Ella's probably read a bunch. Ella? Um, the Five Mistakes of um, Investors. Five Mistakes of Investors. Yes. Okay. Um, it is actually written by, in, I got it from Tony Robbins, the event that I went to uh -huh. almost a month ago. Um, I listened to the audio version of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, fundamentals that you already know of. Mm -hmm. But um, the guy that wrote it, he's actually known as the, I guess, a true um, fiduciary in the financial business. Um, so he basically just gives you advice on just how to invest in the stock market versus 
what you know all these hedge funds and private companies are doing. Mm -hmm. You can actually do it yourself and make way more money than these private hedge uh, hedge funds that um, by trading. To, I guess try to charge you the fees and yeah. all these extra things that, that are not really necessary. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good point because uh, a lot of people think that if they have a 401k or an IRA or things like that, that there is no fees associated with it and the fees are actually, they'll eat you alive. A 2% fee uh, on, on top of what you should normally be paying in the course of 30 or 40 years can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. People don't realize that, but it's a lot of money. Just because people see, oh, 2%, that's nothing. Yeah, but that's taking away from your future profit, which is taking away from your compounding, which if anyone knows how compounding works, it's going to rob you blind. You're not going to know what hits you when, when you go to retire and you don't have enough money. So we're going to get into all those things, uh, but before we do, I did prepare a uh, quiz for you guys so you guys can... Uh, partake in some of the uh, cool stuff that I just uh, picked up on, or well, some of the stuff I picked up on, uh, and then we'll get into that. So I'm going to give you guys the agenda for today, and then we'll jump into that quiz. Uh, I'm not allowed to play she cheats. <laughs> uh, Ella cheats. Yeah, Ella already has the answers. I shared them with her last night. Oh, you do have your admin already running the answers? You already finished. All right. So um, first we're going to go over this quiz and some Q&A. Uh, then we're going to talk about how to get rich. I'm sure all you guys are excited about that. Uh, we're going to do a wealth analysis. I created, um, I created a, a type of uh, chart for you guys to kind of like go through because even myself I'm guilty of. I'm fill, I've, I've filled out uh, probably dozens of personal financial statements, right, for loans and stuff like that. And it always amazes me what I learn about myself when I do. I'm not sure if anyone has ever had the opportunity to do that for a refinance or a purchase, but it really kind of like paints a picture of how well you're doing. But these personal financial statements aren't as detailed, aren't, in, aren't as in-depth as what I created, where it shows you what your monthly budget is, what your expenses, what your income is. Because some people are going to say uh, sooner or later, they're going to be like, well, I want to invest, but I don't have any money. But you don't, you say that, but you don't know where your money's going. You know, so there's people out there who buy $5 coffee every day and they don't know where their money's going. So we're going to talk about that today. We're going to give you guys a wealth analysis chart for you guys to figure out where your money's going, how much money's coming in, how much you have in investments, how much, you know, it's costing you to live. Most of you guys, if I ask you, what is it costing you to live? You probably have no idea. You're probably like a whole lot. You know, like I would probably give you that answer. Probably, you know, thousands of dollars a month just to breathe. But we don't know exactly. So we're, today we're going to figure out how much, how much it's costing us to just be around. Um, our mastermind today was po postponed until next week. So next week we have Michael uh, Puglis, uh, one of Paul Tessa's new agents, is going to be uh, joining us. Uh, as well as next week, we also have uh, two or three K expert John, uh, John Yorkovich will be here. Uh, he's gonna, he was supposed to be here today, but they had something come up. So next week, we do have them coming in, so don't miss that either. That's going to be really good. They actually have some new products uh, that can actually get you paid as an agent legally. So I'm interested to hear about that. So that'll be, that'll be something to, to hear. All right, but now let's jump into our, our quiz. All right, so guys, uh, the... Go to join.quizzes.com. Can you guys see that? Or am I going to have to make it bigger? Can you guys see that? And for you guys watching at home, it, go to join.quizzes. I don't know if you can maybe zoom that in, Danny. Join.quizzes with two Z, all Zs and two Zs at the end, dot com. Q-U-I-Z-I-Z-Z.com. And then hopefully they can see that... Uh, And I'm going to share this as well on Facebook. Hopefully that works. Oh, no, Google Classroom? Oh, no, that's cool. I'm 
13, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, 2029, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, 2029, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, 2029, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, 2029, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, 2029, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, 2028, 2029, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, what is it, like a three-second leg, five-second leg? I think everyone's pretty much uh, there. We got 18. Got some people from home. 19. You jumping in, Danny? Oh no, you don't have your phone, right? Oh, I'm one of the names. Here, Danny, I'll give you my phone. Well, I would put it on here, maybe. <laughs> but you won't be able to uh, control it, right? Yeah, cool. I'll just okay. back and forth. All right, go ahead. You don't need to make change any angles, I guess, for now, anyway. 20? Where's the internet? Google, huh? Safari, huh? Safari works. Yeah, where is it? Alright, we're just about ready. We'll wait for Danny to jump in and then we'll get started. Pressure, guys.
I try to make them a little difficult, not so easy. Well, getting them wrong is, is not a bad thing. We're going to go over all of them. And I don't know, it's like, like one of these, it's like I can read the question time by the time people got answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to give people enough time to Google the answer, so I made it just long enough for. You see when they answer it, like, uh, I was like, the question. Uh, Oh, look at Gotcha. We didn't do too bad, Ed. You're the first, you're the first loser. You know what second place is, Ed, right? <laughs> Ella? Yeah. Did she finish it in like five minutes or one? <laughs> I don't know. I did? Uh, damn spell checker. Brenda, we made a strong comeback. Did you start? Where's Alice? Uh, the, the, the name is Scribe. Alice changed her name? Oh. Her name is Scribe. Oh, I think she might have stepped out, right? Oh, okay, I might have to I might have to take her out. Lauren's probably at home like, I'm sorry guys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm making you wait. <laughs> Laura, just pick anything. Come on. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's not even a surprise anymore. It's like okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, who's umbrella? Any? Who? Okay. All right. Good. All right. So we've got our first, second, and third. Uh, we got we got Ella in first, Ed in second, and Brenda with a strong comeback in third. Um, so let's go over some of these questions and see what what we got wrong. Um, there was um two there was two more book recommendations that was made by a gentleman by the name of George Batar, who was watching us on Facebook. He says uh, Miracle uh, Mir Miracle Morning Millionaires. I'm not sure if anyone's ever read or ha has that book. Uh, and guys, by the way, write these down, man. These are great. I mean, I always take good re book recommendations and write them down. 
And whenever I get enough Amazon points, I just go crazy and buy every book that, I, that I've that um, i been wanting to read. Wait, what uh, is it called? Miracle Morning Millionaires. And there is another one called Wealth Can't Wait. Wealth? Wealth Can't Wait. So I'll, I'll be adding those two to my to buy book, book list. Uh, do you guys keep like um, your notes somewhere? Like keep notes? Like I remember I showed you guys Google Keep the other day. I have a Google Keep sheet that just has books that I want to buy in the future. So if you guys like, want to start one of those for you guys, I'm telling you it's the best thing you could do is in, invest in audio books and, and, and physical books. You get so much uh, education that way. Okay, so let's go over these questions. Okay, as for Robert Kiyosaki, a lot of you guys know that this is one of the best books that we... Um, you probably didn't speak about it yet this morning, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it's more, it, it, the, you know what, I was kind of biased about the book because so many people told me about it and so many people kind of like summed it up and I've seen so many um, like of his interviews that I figured this book is only about telling you to buy real estate, you know, and, and it's not just that, it's actually a financial education book. So this is a good book to pick up, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, if you've never read it or heard it. Uh, according to Robert Kiyosaki, which of the following are considered to be assets? Um, your primary home is not an asset. According to him, it's a liability. The reason why is because if you fall ill and you can't work, who's paying for your mortgage? If you have a mortgage on your home, if you have expenses associated to your home, even when it's paid off, you still have rent. I'm sorry, you still have taxes. You still have uh, gas, electric, maintenance. You have all these things. So no one's paying for that but you. So it actually is a liability to an extent because of that. Uh, obviously it is an asset if you have equity there and you sell it and you make money but it is still a liability it's not covering itself so uh, six people got this wrong um, most people know that um, investment properties are stocks are and he says that your mind is the biggest asset that you have the reason why is because a lot of people have uh, made and lost fortunes but they've always made them back because they've learned so much through the process that your mind is what, what gets you there so if you make a decision today and you change your mindset that's going to be the first step in becoming, uh, becoming wealthy or becoming financially independent. So your mind is your greatest asset. All right, next question. How can you avoid estate taxes when you pass away? Okay, this is a good question because uh, up to a certain time, maybe not too long ago, I really couldn't have answered this for you either. Uh, some people said with a will. Uh, not, not true. Um, owning everything in an LLC or corp. Some people said that. That's not true. Uh, and some people, no, no one said move to Florida, but that's, that was kind of, a, well, you can uh, avoid s state taxes, you know, when you move to Florida. And there is, uh, uh, also they can, in, in Florida, there is an estate uh, tax exemption too, but not to the extent of having it in an irrevocable living trust. Uh, what an irrevocable, irrevocable living trust is, it, it's a vehicle that you have managed by someone else, a fiduciary or, or another um, person. And or usually it's like um, a financial company, and they they keep your assets within this this entity, and it's controlled. It's still it's still controlled by you, but it's managed by them. So you can't you can't really make any any changes, take anything out, or put it uh, or do much to it. But at the time that you um, pass away, all all these um, assets that you have within that living trust get passed on to your heirs through the trust. So you're really not um, giving them individual assets one by one. It's through this trust. It's kind of like giving them almost if you guys want a, an easier example to understand. Sometimes we sell an LLC instead of selling a home, but the LLC has the home. So it's passed through through the LLC. It's the same kind of concept, but through a, through a trust. It's just a different vehicle. So this is a way to avoid all the state taxes and probate. So that would be a, a good way for you guys to... Um, once you guys become wealthy, you'll need to know that. Um, after you pass away with no will or trust, your estate will go through a process which will give you, which will give your creditors time to seek payment of money you owe them and your executor time to collect money that's owed to you. What is the name of this process? Um, most of you guys got this right. It's probate. Okay, I know uh, Ella has had her fair share of probate deals recently and it's, um, it's not a fun process. So if you don't have to put your loved ones through that or if you have uh, people in your family that are elderly, you may want to talk to them about at least doing a will for now because that would avoid this costly, costly process of probate. And it's a long process too that you'd have to pay a lot of, uh, have to pay attorneys a lot of money to get you in and out of. Uh, what is a trust? Okay, a trust is a fiduciary arrangement that allows a third party to hold assets on behalf of a beneficiary. Okay, um, some, pe some people said that it was an account where you keep your money can grow much faster than the bank. 
Um, no, not necessarily. And that's not that's not the correct answer. So, um, just for you guys to start having some financial literacy, literacy. This is what a trust is in in, in this type of um, uh, environment. A trust is a fiduciary arrangement that allows uh, another company or an individual to manage those assets for you in that in that um, account. Okay. Name all types of life insurance. Okay. Actually. Um, I'm not sure how many people got this right. A few people probably got this right. Um, they're all actually life insurances. Um, every one of these is a life insurance policy. Obviously, term life insurance, most of you guys are familiar with. Uh, permanent life insurance is guaranteed to pay out. So it's a lot more expensive as opposed to term life. Because term life is kind of like, let me put it this way. You use term life if you don't have your stuff together right now. You have, um, you have let's say, 15 years left on your mortgage. You have... 10 years left to pay off your student loans. You have all these things that you have to pay off in the event that you die. You don't want to leave that to your wife or to your husband or to your parents or to anyone else. So what you'd want to do is you'd want to get term life insurance to cover you through that term. That way if something happens to you, all that debt is wiped out and it covers it in the event that you pass away. So you leave your assets free and clear. Now, that's a lot cheaper because most of the time a term life insurance doesn't pay out. So you can be, as a, as a young adult, you can get term life insurance for like nothing, 50 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month. It depends on how much you want, but it's not a lot of money. I'm talking about millions. You can, you can get millions for that much. Um, the next one's permanent life insurance. Now this one is guaranteed to pay out. So you're, as long as you keep paying towards it, it's guaranteed to pay out. And the uh, younger you get it, the cheaper it's going to be. If you wait till you're 60 to get it, it's going to be a lot more expensive. Uh, <clears throat> now, this one is going to run you a lot of money if you want a million dollars when you die because it's going to give out a million dollars if you keep paying it. So that's something that uh, you hope to not have to have because your assets hopefully one day will be enough to leave behind to your, your, your loved ones. Uh, variable universal life insurance. This is a, a life insurance policy where they take your money and they invest it in like um, mutual funds and, and other types of vehicles while you're waiting to get your payout when you pass away. Or you can even draw against it, you know, later on in life once it has a cumulative value. Uh, but they will be investing your money and that comes along with a lot of fees and a lot of, you know, uh, transaction costs. Uh, and final expense. This is something where um, you screwed up your whole life and you need to make sure that when you pass away, that there's at least enough money for them to cover your burial costs, as sad as that may be. You know, it could be six grand, 10 grand. And you know what, most people that get this are in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s, and they buy this, and it costs them probably like three or 400, $500 a month just to be able to have $10,000 worth of coverage when they pass away. So that's really sad. So don't ever be in that position where you need to get final expense or let any of your loved ones ever have to go through that. Okay, which investment instrument has the lowest fees. Um, six of you guys got this correct. Mutual funds are notorious for having high fees. So if anyone ever tries to talk to you about getting into mutual funds or investing your money with mutual funds, they don't, they're, they're going to they're gonna skin you. Um, and there's a lot of fees and charges involved in this uh, and tax ramifications because uh, mutual funds trade in and out of stocks a lot. So if they do that and you're partaking in these mutual funds and you jump in there today and they trade it in and out next week, you can get hit with those taxes right away. So be careful with mutual funds. Uh, 401ks, they have a lot of fees. They have a lot of charges as well. Most people don't know that. Most 401ks are investing in mutual funds, and so are IRAs. Uh, index funds are not. They're, going, they're, they're more of a long-term investment, and they, um, they, uh, they source their, their, um, their investments on a, on a very, very wide scale. So they're diversified to the max, and, they're, and they don't trade frequently they trade very very uh, seldomly so there's not a lot of fees so there's not a lot of management costs they're traditionally about a one one to one and a half percent on, a, on the cost of those so those are probably if you want to diversify it would be one of the best things to look into what's up ed what was the point because i got this one wrong so i just want to argue with you here. sure go ahead um i picked ira yes technically an ira in itself doesn't
lifetime tax free. This is really A person uh, who's retired and living on Social Security, that person is getting Social Security tax-free because that money's already been taxed. Okay, so uh, if you're qualifying somebody for a loan, listen to this, if you're qualifying someone for a loan on, on only Social Security, you're able to use up to 110% of that money because it's not taxed. So that's a really crazy way of, of, of uh, qualifying somebody. I never really understood why. But um, you're not taxing that money. You can't be taxed twice. Um, Jim? started investing $300 per month at the age of 25, okay? And had an average return of 7% per year. Bill started investing $400 at the age of 30 and received 8% interest per year. They both cashed out at the age of 65, who made more money? Now normally, like these questions, um, the guy who started with less money is the correct answer, so I kind of reversed it to make you guys think a little bit more, because that would probably have been the easy uh, way for you guys to just guess. Um, the truth is that the earlier you start, the quicker your money will um, compound, so you will make more money than someone who started at a later age. That's 100% true, and you don't have to use as much. Um, I, I, did a, I did a quick formula just to play around with numbers, and I said, what if I invested $1,000 a month, which is 12 grand a year now, or if I did that for my daughter now, and when she retired, how much would she have at 65? If I did it, it'd be about $3 million. If I did it for my daughter, it'd be $70 million, which is crazy because she's only 30 years, um, about 30 years younger than me, but the way the money compounds, it's crazy because you start making money on money on money on money on money. So before you know it, you know, it's, it's a crazy amount of money. So the younger someone can start investing, the better it's always going to be for them. But the correct answer for this was, who made more money? Uh, actually, Bill made more money uh, because uh, he made uh, $725,000. He invested 168,000, I believe, and he walked away with 893. So his profit between what he invested and what he got back was about 725,000. So that's pretty good for Bill. Really, like the only answer I got right. <laughs> okay, you guys know Prince, right? Purple Rain, Pants for No Back Part. You guys know that? All right, Prince died with. Um, Without a will, okay? I'm not sure if you guys remember, he died about a couple years ago, right? All right, so he, he passed away a couple years ago, and he had no will. He has to pay a crazy amount of taxes uh, on a, um, to the government, to the IRS, because his three, $300 million state went into probate uh, and uh, was torn to shreds. So he actually, his estate had to pay $120 million. That's insane. Because he had no will. And I'm talking about like Prince, you guys would think like this guy is protected from, you know, top to bottom and has, has no worries in life. But, you know, people in all walks of life do not get prepared. And just because you don't have a lot of assets, you guys may think like, oh, you know, I don't need a will. I don't need any of that stuff. Uh, but you actually do because you're going you're gonna to drive your, your family crazy if you leave them a, a mess to deal with. You know, so you guys having this education will help you guys get better prepared. So these are just 10 questions I pieced together from a couple books that I read over the, um, over the time I was gone. Uh, did you guys get some 
Some uh, good information out of this. You guys learned something? I feel like I'm getting prepared to die. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what? It's a responsible thing to do. Is you, should always, you, you should always be prepared for the worst case. You know, I mean, it's good to always be optimistic, but you guys have to be, have to be careful. So, I mean, uh, uh, I know that I'm, I'm probably one of the worst ones here because I know this information and I still have to get a lot of things in order. But, um, all right, let's, let's move on to our, 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 our topics now. All right, good. So, I'm glad you guys enjoyed that. See if we have anyone else chiming in. Yeah, a lot of people watching. Berg said, if you get permanent life insurance at 21, for example, does it increase in price as you age? Or I can't read the rest of the question. I don't know if anyone else can. Um, or does it something else? Well, no, it doesn't increase. Once you fix, once you're locked in, you're locked in. If you start paying uh, 200 bucks a month at 21 for permanent life insurance, it can't go up on you unless you unless you uh, don't pay it and you have to reinstate it. Okay. Uh, audio is off, Danny. Pamela said audio is off. Are you good? I think so now. Okay. Sound went out. No audio. No audio. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing? I don't know. How long was it out for? I think you got fired when you get some. How long was it out for? I don't know. Oh my god. <laughs> That's what I was doing. Okay, no bueno. That's what Trump would do too. You're fired. Okay. All right. We're good now? I think so. Can somebody, uh, real quick? I, I think I can. No, we're good. We got all good now. She has to put back. Well, that's what Biggie says. I'm ready to die. And, you know, he kind of predicted his own demise. All right, so let's jump into our next thing, which is the topic for today. Okay, someone, uh, Someone said, "Get rich or die trying." You guys remember? Uh, you guys know Fifty Cent, right? Oh, yeah. Right. That, that was that was um, that was his uh, one of his best albums that he put out. But it's true. I mean, uh, he he really had this focus. He was so focused on you know making it uh, that he gave himself no alternative. And um, you know the, the 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 title of the album may be pretty you know whatever. Kind of sounds like it's a little ghetto. But if you really think about it, you know the guy had he just made it very clear. His focus and his intent was, I'm going to make it by any means necessary. It's basically what he's saying. So if you guys are you know, really that serious about making it, you may want to pick up a similar mantra, a similar philosophy as 50 Cent. You know, even though you guys may think you know, this guy's just some gangster rapper, but at the end of the day, he's a businessman. And you guys may see him as being like all rough around the edges, but you know, it's almost like WWE or WWF, you guys remember what that is. That's just your persona that you have to put on in order to you know, sell. You know, and at the end of the day, if you're not selling, you're not, you're not making anything. So no matter if you're a salesperson or a rapper or whatever you are, or a CEO, you're always selling. So I like that. I mean, uh, Get Rich or Die Trying was his name of his album. So he yeah, really he went bankrupt. He said he went bankrupt. He said that. Yeah. But it was the cover his, I think it was the yeah. cover his rear. He, he's a genius. Yeah. I, I just think at the end of the day that, like, you know, he has a strong legal team because the guy did make a ton of money outside of just music. So he was really smart when he came to that. He probably doesn't give a shit what anyone thinks he, either. No, nah, he's driving around in his like two million dollar car and say, I'm bankrupt. You know, I have no money. <laughs> okay. Let's start with the first question, guys. What is your definition of being rich, right? Now, rich doesn't just always have to be monetary or financial. Uh, being rich could just be, you know, your state of mind because there's a lot of people, and you guys have heard this before, who are extremely wealthy and they're not happy, you know, uh, you know, being happy doesn't come with a, a number sign next to it. Some people say, when I make a million dollars and I have a million dollars in a the bank, then I'll be truly happy and I can relax. And no, it's not true because once you make a million dollars, there's a lot of moving parts in your life, which causes more stress, which causes more, more issues and more things you have to worry about. So money will not ultimately make you happy. But if you build a business, or if you build a process that can create a strong, um, how would I say, a strong life around you, then you can probably be happy. If you have that now and you're not extremely wealthy, you're still rich. You're still rich because you have balance in your life, maybe you've got good health, maybe you've got a really strong family life. Whatever it is, that's, at the end of the day, before we get into financial stuff, that's being rich. Now, we're going to talk about um, how to get wealthy and if you want to, <clears throat> if you want to accumulate assets and you want to accumulate, you know, um, how much business you do. You know, this is the process we're going to talk about today, but um, someone's definition of being rich, maybe it's just financial, but you guys have to remember before you can be financially rich, you have to be rich within yourself. You have to be, 
You have to be prepared to take anything on. You have to be bulletproof. You got. You have to be tough. You have thick skin. You have to be happy with who you are because people will uh, put you down, hit you with negativity, and they're always going to try to shoot you down because guess what? At the end of the day, there's a lot of weak people out there who would rather knock you down than to try to build themselves up. So if you're not ready for that, then don't even consider making any types of money because, you know, look at look at Donald Trump. Everyone, you know, has their opinion of Donald Trump. But at the end of the day, wh what is he? He's the president of the United States. And how did he get there? Because he didn't care what anyone else had to say. Most people, when he heard that he wanted to run for presidency, were like, oh, look at this clown. Or, you know, look at this guy. He's got so much baggage and he's got so many skeletons. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter because he wanted it bad enough. Or maybe that's one example, but just anybody in general. Like, there's a lot of people who in, this, in this world who have made tremendous success and I'm sure have faced a lot of people saying, you know, you, you can't do it. This person will never make it because, you know, because of this reason or they look, they look like that. Like Guys Rocky, want to do Rocky's, it. Rocky's one of those stories, yeah. too. So like he said, Sylvester Stallone. You know, this guy was basically homeless and spent his last money on... On, on just writing this. They made fun of the way he talked. Yeah. That was what made him unique. That's what made exactly. him unique. He believed so much in, <laughs> he believed so much in his, uh, his movie script uh, about Rocky, you know, and, and he really pushed that so hard, so hard, he really believed in it, and he got shot down so many times. And like you said, Harry, they made fun of the way he spoke, you know, they made fun of basically that he was a nobody. But look at him now, like, you know, he, he tells other people no now, you know, he, he, he writes his own checks. So, yeah, you can definitely make it as long as you have the, uh, have the mindset that it's not going to be easy. So? Happy I mean, rich is like having freedom to do whatever you want. Independence, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's just say, hey, if someone said to you, hey, do you want to go to the All-Star uh, Basketball Weekend? This? And then you're like, oh, I can't because I have to work. But meanwhile, like you have all this um, you know, money in the bank. You know, if you don't have financial freedom, you're never going to be able to enjoy your life. And sometimes people say, you know, well, I'll enjoy my life when I retire. But these are your, these are your, your, you know, they say those are your golden years. But like, you're young and healthy now. Who knows what kind of shape or if you're even going to be around when you're 60 or 70. So, live the opportunities and, and live your life as, as you want to, and not just postpone happiness for later. Uh, money will come, believe me, because money is just an object, and you can't really say that. Oh, the, the more money, I mean, more time I spend working, the richer I'll be. It's not true because you could take some time off and meet someone that'll change your life. Or you can, you know, network with people that'll give you more opportunities. So as long as you always have that mindset that you're a walking business, you don't have to be put. You don't have to be, you know, writing contracts or pushing paper or processing files. You could be somewhere else and doing, you know, the other part of the business, which is, you know, getting your, yourself out there, talking about what your passions are. Speaking to people who could, you know, basically bring you to that next level. So there's a lot of ways you can get there, but that was the first step. Second thing, what is an asset, right? Who knows what an asset is? Obviously, an asset. Everyone has different opinions of uh, your personal residence. That could be an asset, or it could be a liability. As long as you're healthy, it's an asset. You know, there's ways to make sure that your asset is truly an asset. So let's just say, for instance, you have a home has two hundred thousand dollars in equity in it. Uh, and you're working and you're making enough money to cover it and you've got savings and you're good to go, right? Mm -hmm. How do you protect yourself against that becoming a liability? Uh, there is a way of doing it which is called disability insurance which covers uh, your income in the event that you get disabled which would help you pay your expenses for a certain amount of time. So that's one way of turning your asset into a, I'm sorry, your liability into a temporary asset because even in the event that you do get injured, you can live for a couple of years off of the uh, disability insurance and then figure out what you want to do. You could sell that home. You know, you could, you know, maybe uh, mortgage it if you had to, or I'm not sure if you could at that point. But it, it, then it gives you some time to breathe because if you just hope for the best, that liability, that asset could really become a liability in no time. Uh, but an asset is something that not only uh, is going to be has an intrinsic value, has, has, has some, some value to it, but there's also assets that pay you and give you dividends and, and, and you can live off of. You know, examples of those are investment properties, right? They're investment properties, they, if they're cash flow and they can give you money to live off of if you're lucky. Uh, you've also got like blue chip stocks that sometimes pay dividends. You know, those, those I'm sure, um, you know, most of you guys and myself included probably couldn't live off of that for now, but it's some, it's some sort of income. Um, anyone else can give me an example of something that is an asset that gives you money to live off of? Right? Your, your mind. Your mind? Mm -hmm. Your business? Your business could be an asset, correct? Right? Now, who knows the difference between a business and a job? 
Yeah, John? The business runs itself. The job you go to create. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a business and you're currently like pulling all the strings and it needs you to survive, you don't have a business, you have a job. Okay? And you may be to 99 and you may, you may be fitting the criteria of being an entrepreneur, but if you haven't created a system where that could run itself, you just have a job. You have a job with probably more stress than normal jobs have. Uh, so a job is just over broke. I know you, you got a lot of you have heard, it, had heard that before, but it's really really what it is because you, if it needs you, that means that you're not, you're not growing, the business is not growing because you're too busy in the day-to-day -day stuff to make that business go to that next level. So uh, if you're running a business, which everyone is in, the, in this room, everyone's running a business, which is yourself, you need to find, figure out a way where it's more automated and it doesn't need you as much. And if you need it to, to get away from that business for a while, it would still survive and still make you money. So you have to figure out ways in that you could become, that business could become an asset. Uh, if not, then your business could be just that, liability. Because if it needs you, that means that if you're not there, it's going to end up costing you money because you still have to make payroll, you still have to pay advertising, you still have to pay all these licensing fees. So it could become a liability real quick. Uh, anyone else you have an idea of uh, what an asset could be? Right. I, a while back, I used to invest in, in, in gold and silver. Are you guys ever in doing investing in that? Okay. Um, it is an asset class, right? But one of the one of the most intelligent investors, Warren Buffett, said that gold and silver are probably the worst investments you can make, and probably the dumbest investments you can make. Because if like somebody from outside this planet looked at what we did with gold, they probably think we're crazy. Because he said we dig it out of the ground, and then we whatever purify it, and then we dig another hole to secure it. Like it is really not, and it doesn't make anyone any any dividends. It doesn't make you any money. So it's really just the fact that everyone believes that there's value in it. It's just uh, you know it's an agreed upon value on, on on something that's intrinsic, and there's really nothing to it. So yes, it is a, a store of wealth. If you uh, peg it against the dollar, it's very volatile. You know, back uh, a couple years back, gold was at two thousand dollars. Now it's at a thousand. Silver was at fifty. Now it's at fourteen, fifteen bucks. So yeah, it, it, it's really volatile, so that, that could be an asset class, but that's more of like worst case scenario, doomsday, you know, like you have something to, to fall back on, but that's another, uh, that's another example of an asset. Anyone else can come up with, with something? All right, that's an asset. So you guys know that an asset's either gonna make you money or has value for you, okay? Has built, built a value for you. Okay, can you guys give me examples of liabilities besides a house? We spoke about that. A car. A car. A car, exactly. Some people think that a car is an asset because it's paid off, right? But it, 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 to an extent it is if you sold it today, but you still need to get around, right? What are you going to Uber it for the rest of your life? That's, then that's another expense. So yeah, a car is definitely a liability. It's actually one of the worst investments you can make. So don't try to like, well, there's, I guess, good ways of doing it, but don't try to drive yourself crazy with comparing, oh, is it better for me to lease or to buy used or whatever? Listen, a car is a liability either way you look at it. It's a loss. So how much of a loss you want to take is your decision. A car is a loss. So don't drive yourself crazy on which one is better, which one is worse. Just get a car that fits your needs and, and, and your liking. You know, it's really, there's, there are no two ways about it. A car is the worst investment you can, you're ever going to make. Uh, another liability, guys, that you could think of? Huh? <laughs> a boat, yeah, a boat, a helicopter, jet, all that stuff. Liability, I mean, look, there's a lot of liabilities. You have, you, you have your your living expenses, you have, you have your tuition, you know, if that's, that, if that's something you guys have, you know, you have these fixed expenses, you know, you have your cell phone, there's so many liabilities that you guys have, there's a lot, a lot of different things, you know, some people may have child support, you know, there's so many things you can consider liabilities, um, but, you know, you guys have to figure out what it is in your life that's a liability that doesn't need to be there, and then we'll get into that later. Okay, how can you become financially independent? Can anyone give me a simplified, dumbed-down version of how can you become financially independent? Get assets. Get assets, good. Passive income. Huh? Passive, Passive income? income, that's another good answer. Okay. Procedures. Say what? Procedures. Procedures? Procedural. Who? It's the same thing. No. Who? Nothing. <laughs> okay. Oh, residual. Oh, residual. Yeah, absolutely. Residual income. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a great thing. Uh, quick answer to it is just have more assets and liabilities. Yes. Right? Have your assets always outweigh your liabilities. Exactly. So that's really the, the easiest way to get rich. Guys, have more assets and liabilities, right? That's the simplest thing you could do. But 
how often have we taken the time to figure out if we're there? And how, how often have we just maybe said, you know what, I'm working my ass off, I'm making good money, and my, my, my bills are getting paid. But meanwhile, you don't know what your bills are, and you really don't know how much you're making if it's going to be consistent. Because one thing is guaranteed in sales is that your income will fluctuate. It will fluctuate with the market, it will fluctuate with your health, it will fluctuate with circumstances outside of your control. So what you need to do is always come up with ways that where you can have assets that will help you through times when your income is down. You know, for whatever reason that is. And as long as those assets are in place, your liabilities are fixed, there's no problems. And you can go on a vacation for a month. You know, you can do some uh, charitable work and go build houses in Africa if you wanted to. Whatever you want to do, as long as you know that your, your financial portfolio is in, in order, you can be, yeah, you will be financially independent. That's all it is. It's balanced. Yeah, it's balanced, absolutely. That's all it is. Okay, how do you not lose your wealth? Anyone give me an example of how not to lose your wealth? Don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Absolutely. <laughs> don't be stupid. Okay, exactly. No, don't be stupid. I mean, look, I gave you guys, I gave you guys one example. I'll, I'll, give, I'll let you guys give me some other ones. Um, one example of how to not lose your money is don't invest on anything you don't understand. The, you know, Richest Man in Babylon, the book I, I told you guys about earlier, is a very, is a very good book to understand that, that a fool and his money will soon part. Okay, when you invest in things you have no clue what they are, just because they sound good, it's the quickest way to lose any money that you that you have in your possession. If you invest in something that you understand fully, if you if you invest in something that's sound, something that has a, a real true value to it, you'll you'll be okay. But you make sure you understand what, what you're investing in before you do. And that's why I've always been so kind of hesitant in investing into like uh, other vehicles outside of real estate because I truly understand real estate and if I understand it I'm going head first so that's one of the biggest reasons why I've done that now any can anyone ask me a way of not losing your money yes well I would just say like the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing don't do that because if you're doing that then you're yeah. gonna need more assets to pay for those liabilities live within your means <clears throat> yeah. yeah live within your means absolutely just because you had a good month doesn't mean you should go out and get a brand new car or you know, go on like this crazy adventure vacation that, you know, most people have never even thought of. You have to have consistent income, like you said, and you have to have assets to help you do that. That's, that's a good way of doing it. Live within your means. Just because your neighbor put up a pool doesn't mean you need to. You really got to think about it. Like, you know, a lot of people, you know, you, you see spending a lot of money or driving a, a fancy car every other year. Uh, these people are living all in debt, you know, and once that house of cards falls, you know, they're gonna, not going to be in a good position. But the person who is modest and you know kind of lives within their means and you know spends on you know um, their um, ex you know spends spends on some luxuries here and there and there's not wrong with that you got to treat yourself once in a while too but live within your means and make sure you can truly afford that or that your assets are covering that that luxury uh, so that's a good example Ed um, another example guys anyone okay taxes a lot of people in this room can avoid paying more taxes than they, they, they currently are but they have not figured out a, a tax strategy. So taxes are gonna, can definitely eat you alive if you don't figure out a way to keep them under control, if you don't figure out a way to maybe um, pay uh, less. And there's nothing wrong with paying less taxes than what you previously were because you're using uh, legal parameters within the tax code. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? A lot of ways of doing that, you know, you guys can talk to your accountants about, um, about how to do that or strategize for the future, or maybe you're not taking your full exemption on your, on your, you know, your children or whatever the case may be. You guys can figure out different ways, but really you start to think about, you know, why is it that, you know, you're, you're paying X, X amount of money every year. Maybe you want to get a second opinion from another accountant, because I know there's a lot of people in this room who have visited um, my accountant and they've saved a lot of money because they figured out things that were done wrong in other places. Uh, so always make sure you get a second opinion if you think you're, you're paying too much. <clears throat> All right, who's heard um, of the Robin Hood theory? You guys know the Robin Hood theory? You know, you steal from the rich and give to the poor. You know, and, and, and growing up, I, you always thought, oh, Robin Hood's such a hero because he did that, right? But at the end of the day, um, Robin Hood didn't realize that uh, there is um, there's a strategy, there's, there's, a, there's really a, a no right strategy to doing that because the rich, so, so called the rich, are the ones who create the job opportunities, the ones who create you know, wealth, the ones who create uh, all these new types of uh, ways to um, help the community because they're creating 
jobs and creating and creating all types of of assets. You know, so with with that being said, the true the the ones the ones that are being uh, taxed to death right now, uh, when this Robin Hood theory, you know, because a lot a lot of times you guys know that the ones that are paying the most taxes, a lot of that money goes to the poor for the um, for the what's it called for the programs and for all the things of you know that that the poor people might need. But the truth is that that money is not coming from the rich. The truth is that money is coming from the middle class. So if you find yourself to be in the middle class and you find yourself to not be taking advantage of all these tax uh, loopholes, your money is probably going to all that unnecessary stuff that you shouldn't have to pay for. And I'm not saying that people who don't have means and people who don't have uh, opportunities in life shouldn't get help. I'm just saying that if you had that money, you'd be able to create more opportunities, you'd be able to create more more jobs, more everything, and then that would probably help uh, the economy a lot better. So with that Robin Hood theory, um, if you really think about that, the middle class is really the current, uh, is, is really the modern day rich that they're being, you know, um, I guess robbed, you would say, um, and then that money is going to the poor. So don't find yourself being in that middle class section where you're not taking advantage of all these um, exemptions, all these things that can help you get to that next level and make sure your strategy is correct, make sure your money's not going into places. Obviously, there's things you can't avoid. You know, there's certain things you have to pay. You know, everyone has to pay Social Security, everyone has to pay these other things, but make sure you're not in that category where you're getting hit for no reason. Uh, it's, good to help the, it's good to help people that are underprivileged, so wouldn't you rather do it yourself? Wouldn't you rather do it with money that you make from your investments and money you make from your business and go out and, you know, give directly to organizations and charities that you want to be a part of? or give it to a family from maybe a local church that might need it, where you know your money is better spent. Because if it goes through the, if it goes through the, the government and it gets siphoned from you, you know a lot of that is going to um, the administrative fees. Exactly. So you're not really getting the money where it should go. Okay. When is it okay to acquire liabilities? Right? I think we spoke about this. I won't spend too much time on this. But when is it okay to acquire liabilities? Quick answer, anyone? It's okay to acquire liabilities in a couple of situations, right? A liability is okay to acquire if your assets are paying for it, okay? So if you have to work for it, and, you, and, it, and it depends on your uh, hard work and, and, and let's just say whatever you make as a salary, if that's covering your liability, then you gotta be really careful because that's one more thing that you have to account for if you lose your job or if you get sick. You know, that's something that's gonna always be there. So, you know, in your mind, I know you guys are thinking right now, like, damn, how many liabilities do I have? What happens if I get sick? Like, what, how do I take care of these things? You know, there's other things that are okay to acquire, too. So, mortgages, they're liabilities, right? Yeah. And, Ed, when is it okay to acquire a mortgage as a liability? Especially if you got a rental investment property. There you go. If you have an investment property that's covering that mortgage and giving you cash flow, then it's okay to work with the bank's money. It's definitely okay. Many, many years ago, um, I would say decades ago, and, and maybe uh, Tom, you can you can remember this. Uh, if you took out a mortgage on your house, you were considered to be a loser, right? Like you didn't have your stuff oh, together, yeah. right? You used to have to pay for them. Yeah, you had to even pay for your house, and then it became okay for you to have to put maybe twenty percent down. Now people buy houses with no money down, three percent down. So times have really changed. But when it comes to uh, business, if your mortgage is covering the asset, and I'm sorry, if your um, asset is covering your mortgage and it still has cash flow then that's a good thing to do. Imagine acquiring 20 of those, and each one of those leaves you $1,000 a month. Tom? First, I need, I need to think of something. The first house I ever bought, yep. paid $17,000 for it. $17,000. 17000 Yeah. I had a $3,500 mortgage, uh -huh. and I said, hell, I'll never pay this. Uh -huh. I'll never get this paid. Yeah. And that's the way people talk. Uh -huh. Now, nothing down, nothing down. Wow. $3,500 as a, as, a, as a principal on his yeah. mortgage, yeah. yeah. That's like, more, that's like people's mortgage well, payment now. <laughs> Never got yeah. But how long, how long did it take? Like five years? How long did it take? It took me, well, actually, it took me about uh, a year. A year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, took me, it took me two horse trades. Uh, oh, that's right. Look at that. Something like that. Awesome. That's crazy. Good for you, Tom. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> Have you guys heard um, the term <laughs> diversification? All right, you guys know what that is? Okay, diversifying um, could mean a lot of different things to different people. Uh, diversification is protecting yourself against fluctuations, okay? 
So you guys know that a lot of assets are move opposite of each other. Like I said earlier, gold goes up when a dollar comes down. Right? Economy is doing bad. Gold, go, gold goes up. So those are two examples. So you're, if you're invested in both, you know one will offset the other, which is cool. You know that's that's good because you know you'll never, you'll always almost be at a break-even point there. Right? Now what happens if you um, think of it on a global scale? Sometimes the U.S. is doing extremely well, and sometimes emerging countries are not doing that well, and sometimes it's opposite. Some, sometimes other countries are doing better than the U.S. So if you start thinking about it, okay, let's just say you want to diversify outside of real estate. Because even within real estate, you could diversify. You can buy uh, uh, um, apartments uh, or apartment houses, apartment buildings, in really, really like bad areas that you know might come up, and you're kind of speculating that they will. And then you can also buy homes in, in, in like B neighborhoods where you know that the uh, values are definitely going up, okay? So you know that in case the values in the B neighborhood don't go up, the values in the C neighborhood may go up because there's a good room for, for growth there. But let's just say that that market stays down and doesn't go up, but the other market does, then at least you have your growth there. So that's the uh, diversification within, a, within one class. You could also diversify into different ways within real estate of making money which could be flipping properties, right? You can wholesale properties. You can um, keep properties as long-term investments. You could do so many things with, with, with real estate. You know, that's another way of diversifying. But if you want to diversify outside of real estate, you could diversify into different things. You could diversify into the market. You could diversify into maybe holding notes. You know, you guys know that uh, mortgage companies do this all the time. They give you a mortgage and they hold the note. They collect X amount of interest on your money. And they pray that one day you won't make your payment anymore and they take the asset back. You know, so there's a lot of ways to diversify outside of just buying real estate. You know, you can definitely also think about investing in, um, in stocks individually if you wanted to. But know what you're investing in, guys, because that's a quick way of losing money. I know, I know, I know Alejandro, he does a lot of trading, you know, and, and I'm sure he's lost a lot of money along the way where he's learned his lessons and also made money. But you, you really have to understand what it is you're investing in. So, you know, there's people who say, you know, buy small cap companies in, outs in, in, in emerging countries because they have the, the biggest room for growth. Yeah, but they're also the riskiest, you know, and you could lose a lot of money. So if you want to take that bet, you know, in, in, in these small caps, you should leverage yourself in a way where if it does go bad, you also have money invested, let's say, in a blue chip company that is, you know, not going out of business and will go up in value but not as much as the blue chip, as long as the small cap will, if that small cap hits big. So what does that mean? You take a thousand dollars, you buy five hundred dollars worth of the, the what's it called, the um, small cap, and you buy five hundred dollars worth of the blue chip, um, you know, company like Coca Cola, let's say, and <clears throat> you wait it out. You know, you don't day trade with it because if you day trade with it, you're going to get killed with fees and you're going to speculate out of fear, okay? You guys are going to sell it when it's dropping, and you're going to, and then, and then you won't sell it when it's high because you think it'll keep going high. So human nature is for you guys to lose money and stop trading in and out. It's just the way it is. You have to be very disciplined to, to make any money that way. But if you leave it long term, that small cap can go through the roof and make you a lot of money, and that blue chip could maybe stay flat, and then you make money with your, with your, with your uh, small cap. But what if the small cap goes out of business, right? And you lose your $500 there because it went out of business. At least you got the other $500 in a, in a, in a what's it called, in a blue chip company that will eventually, maybe in five years, recuperate the loss that you had with your small cap. So that's, that's, a, that's a, like a real simplified version of diversification within stock. But you could do this across a, a different assets. So let's just say you had $10,000 to invest. Maybe you put $5,000 here in, in stock. Maybe you put $3,000 maybe in, um, I don't know, maybe a, a bank account in a different country that pays you a higher interest rate. You know, some people uh, do that, that, that I know do that here because in other countries you get like 8%. You know, you get like crazy percent interest on your money. And then some people, they might buy index funds. You might do whatever it is, but you want to trade in different, in different areas because if the economy goes up, down, or sideways, you're always protected. But if you're all in on one asset, let's just say you're all in on real estate, Right? And your whole game is flipping. That's all your game is. If the market crashes, you're going to get skinned alive. But if you're in real estate and you're just holding uh, rentals and the, the market tanks, you're okay because you're still living off the rental income and no one's forcing you to sell anything at a depreciated value. That's an opportunity to buy you know, when the market tanks. So that's diversification for, for you guys who have not 
thought about, you know, how can you diversify yourself? You can diversify in so many different things. I could, I could be here for the whole uh, rest of this um, presentation just talking about that. But I'll leave that up to you. Um, you guys understand the laws of compounding. I gave you guys a quick example earlier on when I told you if I invested $1,000 in myself, now I'd have $3 million at 65 and I'd do $1,000 in my daughter's name. Now she'd have $70 million at, at this age of 65, which is crazy, but it's just the laws of compounding. So what I'm saying is that compounding exists in a lot of different uh, areas, right? Uh, most people know compounding to be, um, to be the case when you're investing in uh, funds, right? So funds, you have your money locked in into these funds, and every year you're going to get a percentage of return depending on how the market's doing and how your fund manager's doing. Uh, and that percentage, right, will always, you know, it'll be something will be there. Hopefully it'll always be positive, but it'll be compounding on the money that you're increasing every year. So hopefully that money grows. But who has ever thought about real estate also as compounding? Has anyone ever given it that much thought? All right, All right Jack, can you explain the, um, the way the real estate compounds? Um, well, it's a little bit different because if you have already a cash flow income, you also have appreciation. Yep. Um, you also have, uh, if you know how to do um, uh, tax assessments, uh, uh, or you can actually get your taxes lowered, which will yeah. increase the cash flow. Yeah. There's different means of income coming in. You sure. Add, uh, laundry in the basement, mm -hmm. even more. Yeah. So there's different ways to bring in different incomes. But um, as, your, as your liabilities decrease, so if you're paying over mortgage, your liabilities is actually decreasing, in which case your cash flow will be increasing. Correct. So you have you have several different avenues of increasing the asset. Exactly. There's a lot of different ways. There's, yeah, um, having property is is, um, is definitely not only that, John. Like those are great things, but you forget about the um, uh, tax write-offs that you have with with uh, real estate. You know, you have so many um, avenues that open up. If you're a W two employee and you get an investment property, now you have a business, now you can write off so many things, right? So for that teacher that's getting skinned with taxes, if they own one investment property, they can write off their car, they can write off their cell phone, they can write off so many things, that opens up a lot of avenues for that school teacher. But the true way that I think you guys should look at it as real estate as being compounding is like this. I'll give you an example. Let's say today um, I own no real estate whatsoever. I went out and I bought my first investment property, I bought it for $100,000, right? I fixed this place up, now it's worth about $200,000, right? I rent it, and I'm making about three grand a month. My mortgage payment is, let's say, $1,500. So I'm making $1,500 a month on this one property, right? All right, so every year that goes by, I can raise those rents as much as I want, as much as I want to put on a lease, three, five percent. So that means every year I'm getting 3% more, 3% more, 5% more, 5% more. Before you know it, you know, your, your mortgage, I mean, sorry, your rental income has been compounding. You know, that's one example of it. Okay, so just do those numbers in 30 years. Right now you're charging 1,000. In 30 years, what is that going to be? In 30 years, that might be $15,000 a month. Who knows what people will be paying in, in rent 30 years from now? We don't know that. We can only say what we, can, we, what we have today. What's that? There's one guy I follow, this guy Thatch, but, mm -hmm. um, Carlos, my brother, were actually going to be going out there to Seattle. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, he started with his first property he bought for $100,000 and yeah. put like 5000 down. 20 yeah. years later, that property is worth a half a million. Yeah. And now that guy owns over 250 properties, has a quarter of a million dollars in business pass and income alone. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's exactly where all of you could be if you start. That You just have to make the decision to start. Uh, the other way that real estate compounds is very simply, Harry just touched on it, the guy has $250,000 worth of passive income right now. And the reason why is because he didn't stop at that one property. So you take that one property and it's worth, um, what we said it's worth, uh, three, what is that, 300? It's worth 300 grand now or 200 grand? What did I say? 200. 200 grand. Let's say the house is worth 200 grand and I bought it for 100. Now Ed could take 70% of that income or maybe even 80%, I'm sorry, 70 to 80% of that value of that house at 200 now and he can cash me out which means that now I can take $150,000 or whatever out of that property and I can go and I can do it again. And then he can cash me out again and I can do it again. And he cash me out and I can do it again. Before you know it, guys, you have one property that got me a second. Now I've got two properties that could buy me two more. And i got four properties and I could buy me eight properties. So you guys understand how quickly this will snowball? 
the only thing is you have to be ready for it because I'm telling you, your life will change before you know it. So real estate is an amazing, amazing vehicle to see compounding work. And uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a true testament of it. I had no investment properties uh, five years ago and now I have over 20 investment properties that I'm like, I'm going crazy already with it. So you guys can do the same thing. You guys can easily do the same thing. Uh, you know, like I didn't have the um, luxury of being able to refinance them as soon as I, I bought them. Now that I know what I know, um, you guys all have the ability to do the same thing. Even if you guys think, oh my God, my first property is moving so slow. My second property is moving so slow. Before you know it, guys, it's like, um, it's like, how would I say? You guys know what a flywheel is? A flywheel is like this big wheel that like, it turns like, uh, like a mill or something, right? It's very hard to push initially, very, very hard. You have to use all your might to push it. And it could take you like maybe, who knows how big the flywheel is, it could take you uh, an hour to get it to revolve one time. And the second time you push it, it goes a little bit quicker. And before you know it, it's revolving so quickly by itself and it's got so much momentum, it doesn't even need you anymore. So that's the same way that building real estate is going to work. You have to work really hard at the first one. And the first one is actually going to be your biggest success ever because it's going to pave the way to everything else. But just be smart with your money and don't take that money and go and you know buy a car with it or you know don't fall off the path. You know always you know be very humble in what you're doing. So and what you're saying is just take that money, continue to uh, pay make pretend that money doesn't even rent, exist. Right, sure, right? Yeah, make sure make sure that money doesn't even exist to you. Have. Yeah, that's why you have your real estate income because you right. you live off of that and your investments you reinvest. Okay. Right. Now some people say, look, I don't even have that money to invest initially. I can't buy my first house. And we're going to talk about that. Okay, I have no money, is what some people may say. I have no money to start, right? The reason why you have no money to start is because you prioritize the wrong things. You, a lot of people spend money in their life that they don't realize it could be better spent somewhere else, okay? Some people don't value what they have either because just because you don't have money to start doesn't mean that you're not valuable, right? What do I mean by that? I mean, you guys are licensed real estate agents who see properties first before anybody else. And there's people outside of real estate who have all this money who don't know the first thing about real estate. So what your job is to do is if you have no money, either A, be more disciplined and save some money of your own until you have enough for your own down payment. And that'll take you some time. There's not, nothing, nothing wrong with that. But your other job to do is think about how educated are you? How smart are you? How many opportunities do you have? And leverage that as the value you're bringing to the table. Team up with someone who has money sitting in the bank and is doing nothing with it and say, hey, let's do our first investment together. I'd love to bring something to the table that I know you'd be very content with, which is maybe a, a home run deal, a great, a great property. You know, you might be working on a short sale. And it could be a great opportunity for, for an investor. And instead of just handing that investment over and saying, you know, here's a good property and I'll collect my 5%, 6% commission and be happy with it, see if you can put yourself in that deal with the, with the person and say, look, I'm gonna bring you this deal and it's, I mean, it's a very, very exclusive deal. I could bring this to anyone, but I, I really like the way you operate. I like the way you are as an individual. I can picture myself having a partnership with you. Would you do this property with me? If you did that property together with that person, it would probably give you enough money to then do your own property after that. And now you have money to do your next, next project. So then you keep going after that, guys. And that's how I, I started. That's how many people started. Um, you know, and then before you know it, guys, you have your own portfolio of real estate. So I want to give you guys some examples of people who started with nothing because I know you guys are saying, all oh, my circumstances are this and I have, you know, kids I got to take care of and I got like my parents that are sick and I got to help them. And, you know, I, I really don't know. I'm not, I'm not good at talking to people. So I'm going to give you examples of people who, who came with nothing and through the years with whatever passion they had or whatever investments they had, they become extremely, extremely uh, successful. Obviously, you guys know 50 Cent, right? We spoke about 50 Cent, and I use it as an example because we used his, his philosophy. 50 Cent lost both his parents at the age of eight years old, and he um, had to grow up with his grandmother. And you guys know it's very difficult to um, live life without your parents, who I'm sure are a big influence on most of you guys. But he found a way to make it through life with no parents, and not only make it in, in, um, in music, but make it as a business person entrepreneur and there's probably no country in this world where 50 cent isn't well known and well respected so at eight years old he had no parents so you know don't get down on yourself and think you know my circumstances are messed up um, <clears throat> Warren Buffett Warren Buffett started hustling when he was a kid selling bubblegum in newspapers alright so that means what 
It means if you don't have money to invest, get creative. You know, sell something. You know, find another way to make extra passive income or make extra money. You know, I know a lot of people who will say, you know, I go to, I go to uh, garage sales, I, I go to flea markets and I buy old cool stuff. I clean it up and I put it back on the um, eBay or I put it on Craigslist and I make a uh, profit. I had a friend who was um, um, in the union and he also hustled on, uh, on uh, what's it called, on, on, on Craigslist. And he would buy rims, he would buy rims on, on, on Craigslist from one guy, clean them up, and take a better picture and sell them for double the price. And he would, one time he even bought and sold a car on the spot and never even used any money. He had the two people meet him there. And the one guy, he took his money, paid the other guy with it, and just made the in-between hustle. So what I'm saying, guys, is that if you, if you don't have money, it means that you're not hustling hard enough. You have to figure out a way to hustle hard enough to the point where you have that extra money. All right? I was listening to him the other day on a tape, and he said that, um, Warren Buffett, he said that you really need to do something that sets you on fire. Yeah. Um, something that you're passionate about, something that you wake up in the morning, like, like for training today, like I was excited, you yeah. know, I haven't seen you in two weeks, mm -hmm. um, and he said when he took the job that he took, he didn't even ask how much money he was going to make, he yeah. didn't care, he wanted mm -hmm. to learn, perfect the crap, and the money will follow. Sure, absolutely, 100%. Even in Rich Dad Poor Dad, um, I'm listening to audiobook now, <clears throat> he, um, he took a lot of jobs that his rich father, I'm sorry, his, um, his educated father would tell him, what are you dumb, taking a job with Xerox? You know, like you're, you, that's, that's a sales job, you know, he, and people looked down upon salespeople at that time. And he said he wanted to go there because Xerox had the best uh, sales training in the industry. So he went there, worked there four years, climbed his way to the top, and then left because he got his sales training out of there. So yeah, it didn't matter about the money, man. It mattered about what he was learning, so what he was getting out of it. And then he went to the Marine Corps because he wanted to learn how to lead and lead troops into battle. Like, that's crazy. Like, if you can lead people into war, you can lead people in business anywhere. So absolutely, Harry, that's a good point. Um, next person most people have never heard of, um, his name is Sheldon a a Adelson. Uh, he borrowed $200 for his first newspaper license uh, many, 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 many years ago, and today he's worth $44 billion. Damn. So, you know, like these are people that you don't even know, you've never heard of before, but just started hustling. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's okay to hustle and, and, and lose, and hustle and, and learn is really what it is, because as long as you make all your mistakes early on in life, you can always recuperate from them, okay? It's not a death sentence. It's only when you give up. It's only when you sell that stock, it's only when you sell that property at a loss, is when you lose. So don't, don't ever give up. Um, okay, Oprah Winfrey. You guys know Oprah, right? But I don't think a lot of you guys have probably read her biography or learned too much about her. But they were so broke, uh, Oprah Winfrey was so broke as a child that her mother used to make dresses out of potato sacks. And kids used to make fun of her because she wore a potato sack as a dress. But you guys know today who the woman she's become. And, you know, she's had a lot of, uh, she grew up in a broken household, single mother, you know, a lot of half-siblings, and truly a lot of, like, things that would discourage most people from carrying on or, or wanting to do something great. Uh, but she never let her circumstances get her down. So I don't think you guys can have a day in your life where you could say, I'm so humiliated because I have to wear a potato sack. So if, if, if she made it and she's who she is today, I'm sure you guys can, can also get through anything. Uh, at all. Um, anyone, anybody want to add anything to what, or, or what we're talking about? Because I'm pretty much done with my presentation. I want to give you guys the wealth analyzer. Anyone want to add to that? Well, I'm not going to wear, I've never wore a potato sack, but you're going to see me up there one day. You're going to be like, hey, where is a potato sack? You're going to wear a potato sack and you're going to give it my video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just for that, I'm going to leave that started. Yeah, um, someone commented on one of our feed. Uh, Derek said, don't lose money and follow rule number one. Don't lose money. I think that's what Warren Buffett says, right? That's Warren yeah. Buffett's first rule. Uh, Jasmine said, rich to me is when you discover who you are and what you want and enjoy your journey and your path to, I don't know what the rest of the message says because I can't read them all for some reason. And um, George says, drive your expenses as low as possible, especially your housing costs, stick to your budget. Okay. A lot of good advice. All right. So, what I want to do now, guys, is I want to give you guys a, a, a little bit of time. I'm going to share with you.
the wealth analyzer. If anybody's watching online, give me your email address and I will share you um, the wealth analyzer as well. Okay guys, I just sent everyone the analyzer. What this is, is, um, and don't get scared, I just put a lot of different examples here. Yours may not be this, this long, or this, you know, this, this, this big. I'm just gonna go through it with you guys really quickly. Okay, what this is guys, is a way for you guys to figure out what it is that you have currently going on in your life, and where you wanna be. So it looks a little complicated. Uh, I'll wait for you guys to get the, the link and open it up. Um, Steve. Uh, could you share with her yours? I don't think she has an email address, right? Yeah, huh? she can look on with you. Yeah, she can look on with you? Yeah. Okay, and then um, if you